It should be. It's pretty bright. All right. Uh, so I didn't know how much time we'd have, so I didn't actually give you a handout. Some of you asked about that already. So there's no handout. Um, we, there is last week's, which you have, which will give you a little bit of a, um, some context. So remember, we're making a big turn here. Jerusalem has been destroyed. Jerusalem has been destroyed. All the remaining exiles, except for hey, children, children, attention, please. Um, all the remaining people in Judah and Jerusalem, except for those like minimal support staff for the Babylonians, um, have been exiled. All right. So the messenger has come back and told Ezekiel, the city has fallen. Right. And now that the city has fallen, now the, the whole tenor, don't worry about it. The whole tenor of the book is, is going to change because we're going to go from judgment, the future judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, to now promises of restoration for Judah and Jerusalem. And those always have two, at least two levels of meaning. All right, so the most immediate level of meaning is going to be, shh, the most immediate level, or mo, you know, short term, is going to be the return of the exiles from Babylon, not that many years from now, you know, and, uh, and the rebuilding of the temple, and in, in a sense, a restoration. But we know how short-lived that restoration is because it only is going to be a few hundred years and we're to Jesus, well, John the Baptist and Jesus, and Jesus is saying of those who returned, like of the ruling class, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come. So now Jesus comes, John first and then Jesus, comes preaching the same way Ezekiel did to the same city again. And the same thing ends up happening to them again. Right? The, they're taken this time into permanent exile. They're dispersed throughout the Roman kingdom or the Roman uh, empire is usually what we say, right? And Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is never rebuilt again. Uh, but of course, in Jesus, we know why. It never needs to be rebuilt again. And the promise of a holy nation, a people whom God has chosen, was never to be Israel alone, but it was always to be, Israel was to be the nation to which all the other nations are gathered. So we find out in Jesus that by Israel, he doesn't mean that plot of land over in the Middle East. By temple, he doesn't mean the building on top of the hill, right? Because even when they dedicate the temple, he even said, Solomon, or the Lord even says to Solomon, I don't need a house to dwell in, but you want to build one, so okay, right? Because ultimately, the house that he dwells in is built up on the foundation of Jesus. It is Jesus. And of course, the stones of that house are you. You are the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. You collectively, plural. Sometimes people understand that. My body is a, well, is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is that you and your body is plural in the Bible. But we don't have this in English. We talked about it on Wednesday in the sermon, right? You and you all. You all is the plural. And unfortunately, the translators don't indicate that for you. So your body is a dwelling place of God by the Holy Spirit is referring to the church. It's referring to the collective number of saints who have been gathered together to Jesus. All right, so, um, so on the short term, they are going to come back. They are going to build a temple, but that's not ultimately what the prophet's going to be speaking of. He's going to be speaking of the last, well, he's going to be speaking of the cross where, where the temple curtain is torn in two, judgment is brought upon all Israel, right? And forgiveness of sins is brought to all nations. And then, of course, to the ultimate end, this is all recap, to the ultimate end when Christ comes again and even the dry bones in, in, the, in the desert are brought together with sinews and flesh and, and life is breathed into them again upon the slain. All right. So um, now we talked about last time, we talked about shepherds. And the shepherd motif is a big motif in the ancient world. It's not just in Israel, but it's all over the place. Shepherds can be um, leaders, uh, the kings were called shepherds. Even pagan kings were called shepherds, like Cyrus. And they can shepherd even for God, even if they're pagan. That's not the point. They do it under God's direction. The problem is there's also shepherds who are bad shepherds, or evil shepherds, or wicked, or wolves in sheep's clothing, or you know all the different pictures in the New Testament, right? And so he warns us against them because what do they do? What do the false shepherds do? They feed themselves and not the flock, right? 
right? They, they end up slaughtering the sheep in order to eat. Uh, they don't strengthen the weak. They don't heal the sick. They don't bind up the broken. They don't bring back what was driven away. They don't seek what was lost. And with force and cruelty, they rule. Huh. So who's the inverse of that? Who binds up the broken? Who heals the sick? Yeah. Who brings back what was driven away? Jesus. Yeah. Who seeks what was lost? Jesus, right? I think the lost sheep, right? The 99 goes after the one. Um, and does not rule with force and cruelty. Or if you might, if you prefer, he does not rule the church by law. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. He do, that's not the governing word of the church. The governing word is, I forgive you. Which means the church behaves very differently than the world. Right? And I had the audacity of suggesting that we should actually go around forgiving our earthly rulers. <laughs> It's saying it to them. I forgive you, right? In the name of Jesus. Um, Because I actually think that word works. It does what it says. God, Jesus made attached promise to it, right? So why do we not do it? Oh, we have to hold them to count. We need a new Nuremberg trial. They all need to be hung. Well, maybe. But how about we forgive them? Even if they have to suffer some earthly consequence for their actions. All right. So... um, So the people were scattered because there was no shepherd, and then they were eaten by the beasts. That sounds like the prowling lion seeking some to devour, right? My flock was scattered. Therefore, shepherds, hear the word of the Lord, right? Now we have a judgment against these false shepherds. Because my flock became a prey, my flock became food for every beast. There was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock. And again, all of this, we're talking about prophets and priests and kings talking about Pharisees, we're talking about Levites walking down the road to go to the temple or come back from the temple from Jericho to Jericho or from wherever. I think I preached on that before. Like, why are these guys going to Jericho? What are they doing on the road to Jericho? You're not supposed to go to Jericho. Hmm. These, are the, uh, these are the priests that like to engage in illicit behavior. Anyway, we don't know anything about that. But the shepherds feed them, fed themselves and did not f- feed my flock. Therefore, They've made God their enemy. And don't make God your enemy. How do you make God your enemy? By not listening. Right? He says, I forgive you. And you say, I don't need that. Uh, he's, he's purchased and won for you a great gift by his son's suffering and death. And you say, I don't want it. I, I don't know. That sounds like when I spurned gra- great-grandmother and her gift. You know, She would take the gift back and she would give it to somebody else. If, if I didn't have it proudly on display and I didn't tell her all the ways I'd used it. Okay. So um, the Lord's even worse than that, right? I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep. The shepherds shall feed themselves no more. I will deliver my flock from their mouths. They will no longer be food. All right. So then we talked about this. Um, God is the true shepherd who seeks the sheep, who searches for the sheep and seeks them out. We talked about when he delivers the sheep, when he finds them. And how he gathers them. And that is ultimately on a day, a cloudy and dark day. Right? And remember what day that is? Friday. Yeah, Good Friday. Good. Right? And so it is, um, it is the cross of Christ that draws all nations to Jesus. It's the suffering and death of Jesus for, for forgiveness that actually is what calls, gathers, and enlightens, and sanctifies the church. Um, now, we have a problem with that because we would like it to be, well, go, come to my church because... Because we love, we'll love you. We'll take care of you, which hopefully is true, right? But is that going? Is that is that the, what God has promised to use to bring him to church? No, because even as Paul says to Timothy, I believe that um, be prepared then to make a defense for the hope that is in you. Ultimately, they're going to want want to know why do you love me, right? Are you are you like the government? Like you want to make me an indentured slave? So here, pay into $600,000 of your lifetime into Social Security, and then we're going to pay out $37,000 a year to you. It's like, wait a minute, the numbers don't work out here. I paid in a lot more money than you're returning back to me in retirement. So in other words, you just, I'm just enslaved to you, and I'm just funding your projects. Oh, okay, never mind about the numbers on that. Um, that's the problem. The government cannot show charity. And we've, we have a church. This is, I've had this complaint for years. I've not done anything about it, relatively speaking is that we've divested all of the charitable work of the church to other institutions, all right? So providing people with their, who are in need, who have lost their job, what do we do? Go file unemployment. People who have lost their home, 
go to low-income housing. We, people don't have food, file for food stamps, right? For SNAP benefits. Um, you lost your health care, uh, go and go on to Medicare or Medicaid, whichever one it is for you, right? Um, what, how, you can probably think of more here. I'm trying to go through all the government handout programs. Utilities, yes, utility relief, all of these sorts of things. Now, now, here's the problem. You've all paid into that, so you're entitled to, like, in your time of need to take them, right? But the problem is, is that it's not charitable. It was, it was by force and compulsion, or how did it say it above? Uh, where was that? They have ruled by force and cruelty. It's by force and cruelty, right? Even hospitals. Remember when the hospitals used to all be named Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic Hospital, right? Some of them still retain the name, but are they that at all? They don't even have chaplains on staff. Or if they have chaplains, they're like, they have rainbow hair and they're telling you that you're not male or female anymore and you should be a furry animal, right? Which is the case at like Children's Milwaukee. They've got these chaplains who are barely even people. <laughs> reasonable, I should say, reasonable people. Never mind, they don't believe anything remotely Christian. Anyway, um, yeah, so they retain the name, but they've lost any kind of identity because it's not, the, their dollars don't come from the, from the church. They don't come from Christians, right? And what's the, uh, orphanages? I didn't even talk about that. We don't even have orphanages because those are cruel, right? So instead we have, what's that? What took over that? What? Foster care system. Yeah, foster care system. Which is better? They're in a home. Sometimes. And I don't, it's hard to bemoan the foster care system because I think it's an impossible job. Right? I mean, the best people to raise a child that's been orphaned is, of course, nearest kin. Right? Extended family. But even that can be abusive. Um, it, you know, it's almost, it's, well, it's very hard. But what about the church? Um, Pastor Riley told me a story about his congregation where they, um, what, what they used to do is like, especially with a young girl conceives out of wed wedlock, go to live with the aunt somewhere else, bear the child, leave the child with the aunt, and then come back and act as if nothing happened. And they would do that routinely. Or go live with grandma or something like that. And then I don't know what happened to the child, right, ultimately. Maybe raised by grandma or aunt or maybe just given over to as a word of the state. I don't know, right? But we know the problem with whatever I'm talking about here, whether we're talking about food, housing, clothing, um, just go down the list, medical need, um, orphan, widow, whoever you want to talk about that's in need, when you divest it to, to institutions, you lose love. There's no love. It's not love. It's through force and compulsion. It's done under obligation, and it's always used as a tool to control. All right. Um, now, does that mean that there's never any benefit? Of course not, right? Because the doctors don't, they don't have any control over the fact that the hospital's consolidated and are bought by mega corporations now and aren't run by anything remotely resembling a charitable institution. Um, this is why you have the rise of GoFundMe and Gibson Go and, you know, like, or when Wendell had his insert, right? It's like, I mean, that, that's what used to have to happen all the time. You go to the church, and then you take care of them. We take care of them. Right? But now you do these big fundraisers, and you send it internationally. And I'm not, I'm not bemoaning that. I mean, we've done it, too. We, and our, we had pretty significant medical expenses and not great coverage. But um, I generally only sent it to the church, you know, to fellow Christians. I, nobody else, I think, is compelled. Maybe they're compelled just out of pity, but... Um, not by faith, right? We are, we are compelled by faith. All right. So what, I don't know how I got there. Oh, Jesus takes care of us. Ha ha, there we go. Back to what we were talking about. And he will bring them to their own land, feed them on the mountains of Israel. We talked about the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000 last time, right? Okay. Feed them with good pasture. Their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. And I would argue um, that may have been fulfilled you know, the 4,000 and 5,000 or the Sermon on the Mount, short term, but on the long term, we're talking about, we're talking about the new heavens and new earth, the heavens, right? And to lie down in good fold and feed in rich, rich pasture, which Jesus tells us in John 6 is his word, is his word, which is both rich pasture, bread from heaven, streams of living water, etc. All right, and he brings back the lost, uh, Binds up the broken. We heard that today, right? And strengthen what was sick. So who's the good Samaritan? Jesus. Who's the, who's the one who's left for dead in the ditch then? 
Well, that's actually also Jesus, <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah, because he takes all of that on himself, and then he's brought into the church by the Father for our good. Anyway, um, it's easier to see Jesus as the Good Samaritan than it is to see him as the man wounded in the ditch. Uh, and let's see. And destroy the fat and strong and feed them in judgment. All right, and we talked about judgment not being, um, not just being a positive or negative word, but could be a positive word. All right, so then we had this judgment word between sheep and sheep, ram and goats. That sounded familiar, right? The parable of judgment. Right hand and left hand. Um, and why? Because they've eaten up the good pasture and tread down under his feet the residue of the pasture, drunk the clear waters and fouled them up with their dirty feet. Kids, wash your feet. Why? Because they're dirty. As for the flock, they eat what you have trampled. Therefore, thus says the Lord, we have another judgment between the fat and the lean sheep because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock. They shall no longer be prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep. So this is different than sheep and shepherd, right? Or shepherds and sheep. So last week when we talked about this, um, I suggested to you that I don't know exactly what conflict is happening, um, but it sounds quite familiar when actually it's not often the pastor arguing with the with the congregation, but it's often inner, inner Nicene conflict between members in the congregation who are arguing amongst themselves and have a difference of opinion, right? And sometimes um, devouring one another, right? There's nothing, wrong, I mean, there's nothing more, some of you have been through congregational struggles like that where, you know, it's like people are eating each other up, right? And the only thing that's, the every, no, no one benefits, actually. It just makes everything worse, right? And even some people can't be a part of the congregation anymore as a consequence because, you know, their whole, their whole, everything about the congregation now is soured to them in a sense. All right. So we don't know what's going on here except verse 23, which is where we left off, finally. I will establish one shepherd over them. Hmm. One shepherd. And he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. All right. So I said we'd spend some time on this one. One shepherd. All right. And what does he mean by one, do you think? Yeah, the only shepherd, really. He's like the ultimate shepherd, maybe. There's a lot of people that argue about what he meant by one. Um, but maybe think in terms of the Nicene Creed, right? I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. One, one baptism for the remission of sins, right? Did I miss a pit? Yeah, no, that's it. It's one and one, right? It's one. There's only one baptism. There's only one church. There's, because there's only one shepherd. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, and the good shepherd, as Jesus says, as to contrast himself from the not good shepherd, <laughs> the bad one, the callous one. All right, so now... Um, again, this is, he's going to be shepherd, not just between sheep and sheep, but also between shepherds and sheep. So uh, we've talked in the past about how you might understand the role of the pastor being, the, one of the terms that people have used is under shepherd. So a shepherd, but under orders from the, from the shepherd, right? And that might be helpful for you. I prefer sheepdog. Um, not because I'm not one of the sheep, but... Um, you ever have a sheepdog? You ever deal with sheepdogs? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do that, and he goes there. Do that, and he does that. He just knows what to do because he's right to do it, but he needs a little guidance. Yeah. Just a command. Yeah. We've seen Babe, right? Except that was a pig sheepdog. That's confusing. All right. Yeah. So in here, there's no need for other shepherds because you already have a shepherd. Maybe suggested this even to you in the sermon a bit, right? Like, mm, I know it sounds a little awkward and maybe hard to believe, but you know, do you see Jesus in the pulpit preaching to you? Well, hopefully. I know you see me and you're like, oh, Jesus looks better than that guy does. At least he does in the painting on my wall at home. But uh, do we have one in here? No. Right, but, it, but it's because not only do you see... I, didn't, I left out the other part of that, right? Not only do you see 
as he wants you to see, but you hear what he wants you to hear. How are you going to see? It's by hearing, actually. Faith comes by, not by sight, but by hearing. All right. Um, so then, who is he? This one shepherd? Oh, this is awkward. My servant David. But David is... Where's David? At this point, in Ezekiel. <laughs> They're in Babylon. Where's David? This is not a hard question. You don't have to look at me blindly, blankly. He's dead! Yes. Is that what Bobby? That was you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's dead. He's long dead. Well, wait a minute. How is he going to be the shepherd if he's dead? Ah, yes, right. So we have the promise to David. And I think Ezekiel would have you remember, there was a promise made to David. And what was that? From your, from your line, from your lineage, from your offspring, I will raise up a king like you who will rule forever. Yeah, forever, an eternal king. Right, which um, Jesus, of course, is of the line and lineage of David, as it says. He's even born in the town of David, right? And he sits and he goes into the holy city of David, right? All right. So yeah, now that's connected to that promise. It's in where is it? Second Samuel, probably, is when the promise was made. I think I didn't write it down because I had I had notes for today, but I didn't finish them, so I didn't bother printing them off. Oh well. My servant, David. Um, hmm. Well, there's another note there that we should probably make. Servant. All right. Now, is that how the shepherds consider themselves to be servants? No, we talked about, like, what are, the, what are the tools of kings, especially the pagan kings, not, not the godly kings? Power and wealth and sex, <laughs> generally. All right. They even use that for power, right? With, through marriage, you know, think Henry VIII and all of it. I don't remember the order of them. Dan Van Voris on his podcast, Christian History Almanac, gave a way to a memetic device to remember the, the wives of Henry, but I can't remember what it was. It was like Hatch Match Dispatch, something that, that, that I can't remember. You know. Um, <laughs> right. Why is he doing that? It's for political alliances. Yeah, so it's basically those are the tools. Um, just sheer will to power. Money, whoever controls the money controls the world, and, and, and sex, basically, right? He's going to control procreation, both his and the world, right? And that's how they want to control. But that, that would all be, that's not being a servant, is it? What does a servant do? What's the opposite of that kind of, not what's best for him, but what's best for, what's best for the sheep, right? Um, or you could even think of it differently. He's going to shepherd, not according to his will, but according to whose will? God's will, right? Yeah. So that's going to make him very, very different because he's going to come and he'll be like, hey, Peter, put away your sword. As he says in the garden, did I come out against you with clubs and swords? Right? I could have, I could have called legion of angels down upon you if I wanted. Right? But I did not come amongst you to be served, but to serve, right? To give my life as a ransom for many, right? So that this, again, changes the whole vision. We call the church a kingdom, the kingdom of God, and yet how is it ruled? With Jesus giving himself for us with grace and mercy and peace and hope and love and joy and all of, all of his gracious giving. He doesn't rule by, like, coming in and saying, hey, cut it out, do what's right, or I'm going to strike you dead, right? Of course, that's how people think of the church because they're like, I can't step foot in church because then there's going to be a lightning bolt. It's like, yeah, I know God's in control of the lightning, but I think you're confused with Zeus. But anyway, right? And it's going to strike me down dead because of what I've done. I'm like, no, actually, that's completely backwards. He's going to say, I forgive you, and he's going to lift you up despite what you've done. All right? So he's going to serve you, give you what's best for you, not, not, not hurt or harm you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about servant because at the end of Isaiah, which was about 100 years before this, but that last whole book of Isaiah, which is how many chapters? 48 to 55 or 60? I don't remember. It's 7, 8, 10, 15 chapters of servant songs. It's just all the ways that God serves his people in Jesus, ultimately. And the most famous being Isaiah 52, 53, which we hear on Good Friday. 
right? Uh, what's he going to do? He's going to feed them. He keeps saying that, that he's going to feed them, feed them. Um, why does he have to keep saying that he's going to feed them? Because they are, obviously, if he has to feed them, what does that mean? What's wrong with them? You can speak up. It's all right. Nope. I've lost them. They're just staring at the words. They're hungry. Yeah, they're hungry. I know. I mean, that's a chill. I asked... I'm asking you because it's not a hard question. I don't ask you the hard questions. I ask you the easy questions. Yes, because they're hungry. Hungry for what? Yeah, for God's word, for righteousness. For righteousness. That's the way the Bible usually talks about it. That we hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, for Jesus. Right? So he actually feeds them, and as we know, he feeds them with himself. Uh, and that's how he's their shepherd. All right? There's probably a lot more that we could say about that. <laughs> that just that one verse, I bet. All right. Um, yeah, so David's been long dead. David died in uh, 900 something, 960 BC, and now we're talking about 400 years later, right? It is 2 Samuel 7, by the way, is where you have the promise made to, um, to David about the, the son that would reign upon his throne forever. All right, the king. Um, I do think this does play forward into some of the other ideas that some of the, cult, the Jewish cults have embraced at the time of Jesus. Remember with John the Baptist, they come to him and they say, um, well, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? But, but I'm thinking of the other question where they ask, you know, is, who is John? Is he the prophet or is he Elijah? Or is he Elijah or one of the prophets? And you're like, why do they think he's Elijah? Well, what happened with Elijah? Did he die? No, he was... Yeah, taken up in a whirlwind, right? With the chariot and fire and horses. Fire horses. Do you have any horses made of fire? That'd be pretty cool, though, wouldn't it? Couldn't ride them. Probably not, probably not tame horses. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they had, they had a pious myth that, that Elijah was going to come back along with the Messiah. Well, of course, Jesus says that John the Baptist is preaching in the spirit of Elijah. And John is then the Elijah who, has come, who was to come. Now, he's not Elijah reincarnate or something like that, or Elijah returned from heaven, but rather he preaches as Elijah did. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And here's Jesus. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so they do have this kind of pious um, idea, both the Messiah, and then, but also other prophets returning. I think they, was there another one? Was it Enoch maybe? I can't remember. Somebody else that they thought was perhaps, you look at the Essenes, the guys down at the Dead Sea Scroll people, those people. All right, so that may be in the back, that may end up being in the background. It's like, well, look, Ezekiel promised David was coming back. So they have this idea that people are going to come back. But it's clearly the promise of um, that made about that son of David. Uh, and of course, why, men, why else mention David? We talked about the house and lineage of David, the promise made to David. God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is repeated to David, right? Again, of the offspring. David's of which tribe is J David's of the tribe of Judah, right? Yeah. So, and Judah, of course, the promise was given to him as well. So, so mention David again in the same way we would mention Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. is like to remind us of the promise, or as Paul did in the epistle today from Galatians, right? It's like the promise was given 430 years before the law. The law was given because of trespasses to be a tutor until Christ came. Yeah. All right. Okay, and then I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So um, this is like in Psalm 110, isn't it? Where you have this relationship, maybe we should go there. Do you remember Psalm 110? It's only four verses. You all have it memorized. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my foot, your footstool. You remember that? Oh, yeah. The Lord shall send the rod of strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. That's more than four verses, sorry. You have the dew of your youth. But I was thinking of verse 4 seven verses. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. So who's he talking to here? This was a Psalm of David, right? 
Yeah. So this is a Psalm of David. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. Whose right hand? Well, it's the king. No, the Lord, this is Yahweh, is at your right hand. And then your right hand shall execute kings in the day of his, the Lord's wrath. He, the right hand, shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he, he, the Lord, shall lift up his head. Hebrew does not do really well with, what do, you, what do we call that? Pronoun agreement? <laughs> like, which he is he talking about? <laughs> yeah. But the, it's so, the Lord, this is the, Jesus talks about this. He's like, now wait a minute. How is he both David's Lord and David's son? Right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You see that kind of strange relationship? Of course, we understand. This, well, it's God the Father speaking to, to his son. Yeah. Who is also the son of David, according to human flesh, right? But the son of God, according to, to his divinity. So all of this gets untangled then finally by Jesus. I can't imagine what people were thinking. <laughs> And they're confused. It's like, okay, David's coming again, but how is that? Maybe, okay, it's a son. But then what did, he, what, did, what did Ezekiel say about this, I guess, son of David by implication that's coming again? Well, he's going to be, it's, he's going to be executing the, the God's will as a prince amongst them. And what, is, I don't know that word for prince. I was going to see if there's a better translation. Where's my Hebrew here? Uh, where is that? Verse 23, right? I, Yahweh, will be their God. My servant David will be prince among them. I have spoken. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah, right. Um, and we always run into that challenge with Jesus, right? Do we think of him as less than God? Well, the Athanasian Creed is very careful on this point. In respect to his humanity, Yes. With respect to his divinity, no. They're like, well, how can it be both things at the same time? Well, okay. He's true God and true man. A little lower than the heavenly beings, according to his humanity, but, of course, true God, yeah, according to his divinity. So we already have this promise that of God sending his son, who will be of the house and lineage of David, to be prince, that is to rule and to judge, and all, we, all the things we saw in Psalm 110. So that's probably in the background of here. All right. And then what is this prince going to bring? Oh, we had a lot more to do. I thought we were only going to do two verses today. Oops. What's he going to do? He's going to make a covenant of peace with them. I do not like the word covenant. Uh, I mean, I, I don't mind it, but the word here, I don't know if you can see that, is berit. It can mean covenant, but when we're talking about Jesus, um, Luther is right, use the word testament. Testament, um, because that's that's what, precisely what Paul was arguing about today in the epistle, in Galatians three, is that the promise is a testament that that has once it's been ratified, it cannot be annulled, right? Just like a last will and testament, you can't change it, especially once you're dead. <laughs> it can't be changed, right? It's it's illegal. It's always been illegal, even in Paul in the Roman society. You did not change. You could not change a will after the the testator had died. Right. Even if you didn't like it or if it didn't make sense or whatever. Yeah. So here I will make a testament of peace. And then that connects you back to that day of that cloudy and dark day, the day of judgment. Because it, if it's a testament, then the peace is given in his suffering and death. And will cause the wild beasts to cease from the land. Remember the ones that were devouring the sheep? All right. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Like you don't need a pen anymore. That's a change, right? I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that's beautiful. This is like the most gospel we've heard in this book so far, isn't it? Like three verses in a row? Yeah, beautiful. And then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its incre her increase. Oh, I said that in the sermon today, didn't I? They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, right? 
delivered them from the hand of those who have enslaved them. All right. And again, they might be thinking in terms of Babylon, which they would be right in doing so, because Babylon has enslaved them. They may be thinking of return. Are you okay, Weston? All right. They may be thinking in terms of return to Jerusalem, and they'd be right. But when in the history of Israel did the, could they dwell in the woods and the wilderness and safely? When has he caused the showers and the, and the seeds to sprout and everything to, to happen all the time? It hasn't happened yet, right? Yeah. It has happened in a sense of promise, but it hasn't happened yet in terms of its fulfillment. All right? They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know. We've, been here, we've heard this over and over in Ezekiel. They shall know that I am the Lord, but it's usually when he brings judgment, right? Death and destruction, and etc. When I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hands of those who enslaved them, they shall no longer be a prey for nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely. No one shall make them afraid. No? That comment before church, I'm really afraid for my country. What are you saying then? The Lord's not going to take care of you? He's not, he can't take care of our country? Right? Yeah. No one should make them afraid. Um, what was I going to say? There's a, there's a great expression, and every time I want to bring it up, I forget it. <laughs> ah, yes. Connection is protection. Right? So try to remember that. Somebody write it down so I don't forget it. Connection is protection. Right? So the, the beauty of our, like, I mean, the, the Christian church, you didn't write it down. We'll even write it in red. Come on, you can do it. Connection is protection. All right, good. Good. All right, now it's on the board. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but I'm thinking in terms of Christian church. Right? As long as we have each other, what do we have to fear? Because we, together we have the Lord, right? That's what gathers us together. Um, and I'm, the challenge is that we think like, oh, the building is like some kind of sanctuary. We even call it that. Yeah, no, they'll, they'll walk through the doors if they want to. So that's not, I mean, even the demons, right? That whole thing in the movies where they can't come in. I don't know, it's dumb. It's superstition, right? But, um, but we have each other to build each other up, but also to speak the word and truth, right? So um, that's why you don't be afraid because you have each other. You have a place. You, you dwell safely on a little pasture that the Lord has established for you, right? And I will raise up for them, there it is, a garden of renown. And they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. So, I mean, that's it's too, too bad Don and Karen couldn't stay, since that's like the most gospel we've heard. And you guys have struggled for almost a year to get through all of that stuff. And then it's like, wow, finally, God's going to restore us. And it's not even just going to be a restoration to the way things were, but it's going to be better than it ever was. Right? right. And then I'd, I'd say our challenge as a Christian church, to connect it to the sermon a little bit, is that um, this promise is fulfilled for us by faith, and we only get, but we only experience it in part, or as Paul says, in a mirror dimly. And then we shall see it as we shall see him as he is. We heard in First John this week. We will see it fully, complete, um, but not until the last day. So he holds out this hope for us, but it's not a hope that's like an absent hope that's just grounded on a, you know, what do we call a hope and a prayer, as I said in the sermon. But it's actually hope grounded on his promise. And he's already fulfilled it in part now so that you know, well, wait a minute. I'm with my fellow flocks. He's feeding me on his hills. He's washed me clean. He keeps giving me drink and food. Right? So that I never hunger or thirst again. That's already true now. And of course, we want more than that. And we, and we will have more than that. Right? Right. 
this is always the thing with like, a, you know, that lament about a country is like, your hope is not in your country. Sorry. Or as I mentioned on uh, the Banned Books podcast, you know, everybody talks about how we need to like go back to the Constitution or restore the Constitution as if it's a sacred document that came down from heaven. I'm sorry, it's not. Even if it's the best thing that we've had, best Constitution in the history of the world, it still doesn't save. Right? Who was it that said, you know, um, you know, this liberty is good as long as you'll keep, as long as you keep it? Or yeah, it's Ben Franklin, something like that, right? Yeah. What? George Washington. Yeah, I think it's Franklin. Right. So, so it does protect freedom. It preserve, or it's supposed to. It articulates what freedoms need to be preserved and protected, and who is responsible for that. Um, but as far as it actually, they're empty words. There's no force behind it, except for you, right? So, so then the problem with the Constitution is it's all on you because it's all law. It's up to you to make sure that the country doesn't fall into disre- disrepute and re- disrepair and whatever, right? Because it wasn't, sorry, it might be, God might be using it, but it's not the holy city, it's not the... Never mind what George W. said about it being the whole, we're the city on the hill and all that stuff, you know. In contrast to the church, right? Where actually you have a word, the word of God, which not only tells you what is yours, but actually does it and accomplishes it despite you. The Constitution can't do that. Yeah. I think we just had it solved for so long that people will not yearn for that. Yeah. Back to what we have. Even though we're never going to be able to go back to what we have. No. But that, that's why they keep the Constitution. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not such a black pill on it. I think we can go back to what we had. Actually, I think we could go back to something even better. Because I think we've learned I think we've learned some things. You no, know, I think we've learned about currency and how you know, easily um, it can be devalued. Right? I know you want to be done, Gus. So no, you're looking here, at he oh, he's here and he died. I'll just keep talking then. Yeah. We can be done in a minute. Uh, no, I think we could actually have something better. Because we, like, I was reflecting on this. Um, our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is, has a brilliant organization scheme, even though I don't think we intended it at all. Because it's decentralized. Every congregation is autonomous. And then everything above that is voluntary. Synod, or I mean, district, and, or circuit, district, synod, all of that's voluntary. Many, many districts have, have sold off their district office. I think ours will here soon. And they've downsized their staff and they've moved, they'll move to Concordia, Wisconsin. They'll, buy, they'll have office space there instead. Um, that's what happened in uh, Indiana. They moved onto the campus of uh, the seminary, I think. No, they still have their building. Yeah, they still have their building. Northern Illinois district moved onto the campus of Concordia, Chicago. Yeah, because they didn't need to maintain all that. And, and they downsized their staff because the, the congregation said, we don't, we actually, we don't need you to be doing all the things you were doing. And they actually took what was a large government and they, they narrowed it down over time. That's my point. We say we can't do it. Now we can do it. You just don't, you just don't give them money. <laughs> it's not that hard. You just stop giving them money. Well, I, uh, you mentioned Brian Woods. Yeah. So 71. 71. Well, anyway. 73, 76, 71. Whatever, 71. Yeah, no. When the Bakers? No. 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 It was it was immediately after Jackson left office. <laughs> so you're talking 190. It was within within 10 years. So 1903 we went off, we effectively went off the gold standard then actually. Really? Yeah, they no longer had they didn't require banks to redeem your currency in gold. Even though they it was required to be backed by gold. Yeah. You they they did not require the banks to actually do it. So if you went and you took your and then they confiscated all the gold 10 years after that. So only the government could hold gold. Huh. Yeah. So there's a lot. And then there was a retraction. And da, da, da. It's always, what do, you, what do you call that? Three steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, one step back. But then before you know it, you've already gotten there. You, just, you thought that you made some progress by those few steps back, but no. Um, yeah, so uh, what did I bring that up? Yeah, we could, I think we could actually do better. The Missouri Senate has figured this out. It's like, you, don't, you can decentralize. You don't have to have this massive governing body with, I mean, the, the Missouri Synod's 
the, dis- the Senate office, the Senate, all their offices, all the missionary work, everything they do, the total budget is like 84 million, which we sent twice that to Ukraine for their pensions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not, and it's a big church body. We have 6,000 congregations. Yeah, I mean, it's not. So I, I think we could decentralize, and that's something we could learn that the founders didn't even think was possible, but they didn't have the technology to do it, right? And you can't really do that until you've effectively built an infrastructure, maybe. But now we have an infrastructure, and then the local municipalities are responsible for the upkeep of it. And some will do better than others, and that's where people will live. I don't know. I'm a market guy. Sorry. So, yeah, no, I don't think there's no hope. I don't know why we would say that. I mean, I, I just, why does it have to be catastrophic? If you want to learn about election controversies, go read about the election of uh, Garfield, James Garfield. Just go look it up. Read the story. Yeah. You know, like, this stuff that's happening, like, to Trump or whatever, it's nothing. We haven't had Congress people do duels, shoot out in the, on the floors of Congress. They're not shooting each other. So, anyway. It's not, it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> or it has been. What? They have better ways now? Yeah, I know. They have blackmail. It's really good. Yeah. No, I mean, we've been through this before. And just like, the only, the only way that... The only way they can fail is if we do nothing. That's ultimately. If nobody says anything, if we just allow it. Because the, the, all the force of the Constitution is you. But again, back to, we want to actually talk the Bible. All the force of this constituting document of, that brings the church into existence, which is God's word, is actually the Lord. He's actually behind it because it's his word. And he confirms it because his word takes on human flesh and does it for us in the man, God, man, Jesus, right? So that is a totally different thing. So this is always helpful for people, um, especially when the hearings work, um, to know <laughs> that um, the care and upkeep and maintenance of a Christian congregation, I'm not talking the physical building, but I'm just talking about the ga- calling, gathering, enlightening, and sanctifying, is entirely on, it's all, it's all God's work, not yours. He uses you, yes, but, but it, the power of it, it comes from him, not from you. So you're free then to just serve without fear, not worrying about what's he going to do and what, you know. If you want to think about demographics, you'll get depressed really quick because people are just dying off, right? It's like, well, but how do you know what the Lord's going to do with you tomorrow? I don't know. How would you ever know? We think we do. All right. So with that, uh, we're going to come back to themes of judgment next time. (laughs) <laughs> we're going to prophesy against Mount Seir. But you were like, what's Mount Seir? Well, we'll talk about it next time. All right? So there you go. A little tour de force for you. No handout, sorry. But you get it. Yeah.